What is up everyone, my name is Joseph and welcome back to Casually Competitive MTG where it's our goal to bring you semi-competitive EDH gameplay content that's both fast paced and entertaining. For episode 2 of season 2 we decided to continue with the theme from episode 1 and take some lesser played commanders and then power them up to a semi-competitive level. That being said, before we get into the opening hands and deck introductions, let's go over our channel promotions. First off, if you like what we do and want to help support us, we have a Patreon and a YouTube join button that you can use, and we believe you'll enjoy the rewards that we have set up there. We do want to say a thank you to everyone who does help us out in this way. It's not required, but it does help us improve the quality and the frequency of these videos, so thank you. Next up, if you're planning on buying cards and you want to help out the channel, we have a TCG affiliate link in the description. Clicking on that link and then buying cards will help the channel at no cost to you. And finally, if you want to keep up to date with us and hear announcements like the fact that we're moving our stream to every Friday weekly at 7.30pm EST, we have a public Discord and a Twitter available. That all being said, let's get into the opening hands and the deck introductions. Going first, we have Nate playing Aloro Ageless Ascetic. This deck looks to utilize the passive life gain value to get a lot of value off of spells like Necropotence or Ad Nauseam, all while assembling either a Sanguine Bond and Exquisite Blood combo, or a Demonic Consultation and a Laboratory Maniac type effect. As a quick disclaimer, I want you guys to know that we have seen the comments and we do understand that not all of you like to see a lot of Demonic Consultation based decks. We do want to say that we want to build these decks as strong as possible, so if Consultation fits into a deck, we most likely will be adding it. However, going forward, we want you to know that we will continue to do what we can to make sure that the pawns are set up to be as entertaining as possible for you. We do see and understand the feedback that you guys submit to us. We honestly value and appreciate the feedback. Nate's opening hand contained a Marsh Flats, a Flooded Strand, a Morphic Pool, a Talisman of Dominance, a Thassa's Oracle, a Necropotence, and an Exquisite Blood. Going second, we have Jordan playing Sisse Weatherlight Captain. This semi Super Friends based deck looks to play Sisse early and then pump her up by searching up valuable and low cost legendary permanents like Oko in order to control the board, all while assembling one of his combos, the main one being Nico Bolas and Jace Cunning Castaway. Jordan's opening hand contained a Marsh Flats, a Steam Vents, a Wooded Foothills, a Windswept Heath, a Forest, an Oko Thief of Crowns, and a Supreme Verdict. Going next, we have Joseph playing Lavinia Azorius Renegade. This two-color stacks-based deck looks to stacks out the board with things like Winter Orb and effects to slow down their opponents, and just generally controlling the board with the myriad amount of blue spells available to do this, all while assembling a lock with Lavinia like Knowledge Pool, which essentially stops people from playing Magic if Lavinia is on the battlefield. Joseph's opening hand contained a Plains, an Island, a Mana Confluence, an Enlightened Tutor, a Swords to Plowshares, a Winter Orb, and an Avon Mind Sensor. And finally, we have Bill playing Selvala Explorer Returned. The goal of this deck is to ramp out and get a lot of early game value through green and just through Selvala's own ability in order to assemble one of the combos, those being Mirror Entity and Wirewood Symbiote in order to mill everyone out through his commander's ability, or something like a Karn the Great Creator, an Isochron Scepter, and then imprinting something that untaps creatures, allowing him to, if he has enough mana dorks, turn Isochron into a creature using Karn and then generate infinite mana by continually tapping it and then untapping all creatures, including the Isochron in order to generate infinite mana, and again, mill everyone out with his commander's ability. Bill had to mulligan down to 6, and his opening hand contained a Plains, a Command Tower, a Mana Crypt, a Swords to Plowshares, an Instill Energy, a Hushbringer, and due to the London mulligan he put a Plains to the bottom of his library. Now with the opening hands and the deck introductions out of the way, let's get into the gameplay. Nate starts off this game by first, in his upkeep, gaining 2 life from his commander, Aloro, and then going to draw his card for turn. He then plays a Flooded Strand as his land for turn, and gives the turn to Jordan. Jordan draws, and plays a Misty Rainforest as his land for turn, and then gives the turn to Joseph. Joseph draws, and plays a Mana Confluence as his land for turn, and then passes the turn to Bill. Bill draws, and then plays an untapped Bountiful Promenade. He then, for 0 mana, casts a Mana Crypt. He then taps both of these mana sources to cast a Hushbringer, floating 1 colorless mana. It resolves, and he then goes to pass the turn to Nate, letting the mana fizzle. On Bill's end step, Nate pays 1 life to crack his Flooded Strand, 
However, in response to the activation, Joseph taps his mana confluence, taking one damage to cast an Enlightened Tutor. The Enlightened Tutor resolves and he searches up a mana crypt to the top of his library, and then Nate's fetch resolves and he gets a Watery Grave and has it enter the battlefield tapped. Nate then goes to his turn, untaps, gains two life in his upkeep, and then draws a card for turn. He plays a Marsh Flats as his land for turn, and then goes to give the turn to Jordan. On Nate's end step, Jordan pays one life to sacrifice his Misty Rainforest and searches up a Hollowed Fountain to the battlefield tapped. Jordan then goes to his turn, untaps, draws, and plays a Marsh Flats as his land for turn, and then gives the turn to Joseph. Joseph untaps, draws his Mana Crypt, then plays an Island as his land, and then for zero mana, casts this Mana Crypt. He then taps the Mana Crypt to cast a Winter Orb. The Winter Orb resolves, and he then taps for 2 mana to cast his commander, Lavinia Azorius Renegade, taking 1 total damage from Mana Confluence. With nothing left, Joseph gives the turn to Bill. Bill untaps and in his upkeep loses his Mana Crypt trigger, taking 3 damage. He then plays a Command Tower, and then taps his mana to cast his commander, Silvala Explorer Returned. It resolves and he then goes to combat and swings his flying Hushbringer at Jordan, dealing 1 damage and gaining 1 life. He then goes to pass the turn to Nate. On Bill's end step, Nate cracks his Marsh Flats, paying 1 life, to tutor up a Godless Shrine to the battlefield and has it enter tapped. He then goes to his turn, untaps, and in his upkeep gains 2 life from his Commander's Eminence trigger. He then draws and plays a Morphic Pool as his land for turn. He then taps for 3 mana to cast a Necropotence. The Necropotence resolves and he then pays 7 total life into Necropotence, exiling 7 cards, and then going to his end step. In response to going to his end step, Jordan pays 1 life to crack his Marsh Flats, searching up a Sacred Foundry to the battlefield, tapped. Nate then proceeds to his end step, puts the 7 cards into his hand, and then discards down to hand size. Jordan then goes to his turn untaps, draws, and plays a forest as his land for turn. He then taps for 3 mana to cast Oko Thief of Crowns. I think the world's most banned planeswalker enters the battlefield, and Jordan then activates its plus 1 ability to turn Silvala into a 3-3 elk. With nothing left, Jordan passes the turn to Joseph. Joseph untaps 1 land due to Winter Orb, and then in his upkeep loses his Mana Crypt trigger, taking 3 damage. He then draws and plays a Plains as his land for turn. He then taps his Mana Crypt, floating 1 mana to cast a Graf Digger's Cage. He then uses this floating mana to help cast a main phase, even Mind Sensor. He then goes to combat and swings Lavinia at Oko, and when Jordan declares no blockers, Oko takes 2 damage. Joseph then gives the turn to Bill. Bill untaps and in his upkeep loses his Mana Crypt trigger taking 3 damage. He then draws and plays a Plains as his land for turn. He then goes to combat and swings Hushbringer at Oko, who takes 1 more damage and Bill gains 1 life. In his second main phase, he taps for 3 mana to cast a Mirror Entity. With nothing else, he passes the turn to Nate. Nate untaps, and in his upkeep he gains 2 life from his commander's eminence ability. He then plays a Forbidden Orchard as his land for turn. He then taps for 2 mana, giving Joseph a spirit from the Forbidden Orchard to cast an Arcane Signet. He then taps the Signet to cast a main phase Mystical Tutor. He then remembers that there's an Aben Mind Sensor on the battlefield, looks at the top 4 cards of his library, and fails to find an instant or sorcery. He then shuffles his library and pays 7 more life into Necropotence, exiling 7 cards, and then goes to his end step and puts those cards to hand, and then discards down to hand size. Jordan then goes to his turn, untaps, draws, and plays an untapped Steam Vents, paying 2 life. He then taps for 2 mana to cast a Talisman of Hierarchy. He then decides to activate Oko's plus 1 ability to turn the Winter Orb into a 3-3 Elk. With nothing left, Jordan gives the turn to Joseph. Joseph untaps and in his upkeep wins his Mana Crypt trigger, not taking any damage. He draws and then immediately goes to combat, swinging his newly acquired 3-3 Elk at Oko and then the Avon Mind Sensor and Lavinia at Nate. No blockers are declared, the damage goes through, and then in Joseph's second main phase, he taps for 1 blue mana to cast a Chain of Vapor, targeting his Elk. 
he returns this 3-3 Winter Orb Elk to his hand and then taps his mana to recast the Winter Orb. He then goes to pass the turn to Bill. On Joseph's end step, Bill taps for one green mana to cast a Nature's Claim targeting the Winter Orb, trying to be rid of it for good. In response to the Nature's Claim, Joseph taps for two mana to cast a Delay. The Nature's Claim is countered and suspended with three time counters on it. With nothing left, Bill then goes to his turn, untaps, and in his upkeep loses his Crypt Trigger, taking three damage, and then removes a time counter from his suspended Nature's Claim. He then draws and pays two mana into Mirror Entity to make all of his creatures all creature types and two twos. He then swings four damage at Nate. Nate declares no blockers, the damage goes through, and Bill gains two from the life linked Hushbringer. With nothing left, Bill passes the turn to Nate. Nate untaps and in his upkeep gains two life from his commander's eminence ability. He then plays a Cavern of Souls, and when it enters, he names Human. He then taps for 2 mana to cast a Knight's Whisper, drawing 2 cards and losing 2 life. He gives Jordan a Spirit from the Forbidden Orchard being tapped for mana. He then decides to pay 3 life into Necropotence, exiling 3 cards, and he then goes to his end step and puts those cards into his hand. He then discards down to hand size and Jordan goes to his turn. Jordan untaps, draws, and plays a Windswept Heath as his land for turn, and then immediately passes the turn to Joseph. Joseph untaps, and in his upkeep, wins his Mana Crypt Trigger, not taking any damage. He then draws, and plays a Hollowed Fountain as his land for turn, paying 2 life to have it enter the battlefield untapped. He then goes to combat, and swings his creatures at Nate for 4 total damage. Nate declares no blockers, takes the damage, and Joseph then goes to pass the turn to Bill. On Joseph's end step, Bill taps for 1 mana to cast a Swords to Plowshares, targeting his own Elky commander. It resolves, Bill gains 3 life, and then elects to put his commander back into the command zone. Bill then goes to his turn, untaps, and in his upkeep loses his Crypt Trigger, taking 3 damage. He then draws and pays 2 mana into Mirror Entity's ability, making all of its creatures all creature types, 2 twos, and then again goes to combat and swings 4 damage at Nate, which, when it goes through, gains him 2 life from the lifelink. With nothing left, he passes the turn to Nate. Nate untaps and in his upkeep yet again gains 2 life through his commander's eminence ability. He then plays a command tower as his land for turn. He then taps for 2 mana to cast an uncounterable Grand Abolisher due to the Cavern of Souls. He then taps for 1 blue mana to cast a Mystic Remora. The Mystic Remora enters the battlefield and Nate then pays 3 life into Necropotence to exile 3 cards and then moves to his end step and puts those cards to his hand. Jordan then goes to his turn, untaps, draws, and with nothing really to do and missing his land drop, he passes the turn to Joseph. Joseph untaps and in his upkeep loses his mana crypt trigger, taking 3 damage. He then draws and again goes to combat, and swings his Avon Mind Sensor at Nate and his Lavinia at Bill. Neither declare any blockers, they take the damage, and Joseph then passes the turn to Bill. Bill untaps and, in his upkeep, removes the final suspend counter from Nature's Claim. Unfortunately, since Lavinia is on the battlefield, he is unable to cast this without paying its mana cost, so it just goes into his graveyard since it gets countered. He then wins his mana Crypt Trigger, not taking any damage. He then, for one green mana, casts a Carpet of Flowers, not paying for Mystic Remora, allowing Nate to draw. He then goes to combat and swings his Hushbringer at Nate, dealing 1 damage, gaining 1 life, and then in his second main phase targets Joseph with his Carpet of Flowers, adding 2 white mana to his mana pool. He uses this mana to help recast his commander. With nothing left, he gives the turn to Nate. Nate untaps and in his upkeep gains 2 more life from his commander's eminence ability. He also, in his upkeep, decides to not pay for Mystic Remora, letting it die, and plays a Sea of Clouds as his land for turn. He then taps his mana to cast a Vindicate, targeting the Hushbringer. There are no responses to Vindicate, and Nate then passes the turn to Jordan. Jordan untaps, draws, and in his first main phase, taps for 2 mana to cast a Dockside Extortionist. When it enters the battlefield, it creates 7 treasures. He then sacrifices 4 of these treasures to get enough mana to cast a Spark Double. 
Priorities get around, and Joseph doesn't like this value train that's going on, and taps for one white mana to cast a Swords to Plowshares, targeting the Dockside Extortionist. Dockside is exiled, Jordan gains one life, and then the Spark double enters, and Jordan has it enter as a copy of his Spirit token. He then taps for four mana to cast Supreme Verdict. There are no responses to Supreme Verdict, and all creatures are destroyed. He then plays a Wooded Foothills as his land for turn, and then cracks both of his fetches, taking two damage to save some time, to fetch up a Breeding Pool and an Overgrown Tomb to the battlefield, having them enter untapped, and paying four life total for the two lands. He then taps for two mana to cast a Bloom Tender. With nothing left, Jordan gives the turn to Joseph. Joseph untaps and in his upkeep loses his mana crypt trigger and takes 3 damage. He then draws and taps his mana to recast his commander, Lavinia. With nothing left, he passes the turn over to Bill. Bill untaps and in his upkeep loses his mana crypt trigger, taking 3 more damage. He then draws and in his first main phase adds 2 white mana to his mana pool from Carpet of Flowers. He uses this mana to help cast an Avon Mind Sensor. He then taps some more of his mana to cast an Eladomris Call. When it resolves, tutoring up a Priest of Titania to his hand. With nothing left, he passes the turn to Nate. Nate untaps and in his upkeep gains 2 life from his commander's eminence ability, and then goes to his first main phase. He plays a Mana Confluence as his land for turn, and then taps for 2 blue mana to cast a Thassa's Oracle. Nobody has any responses. It enters the battlefield, and in response to its ETB effect, Nate taps for one black mana to cast a Demonic Consultation, exiling his entire library, and then when Thassa's Oracle's ETB effect resolves, Nate then wins the game. For a pod that had basically two stack stacks, there was a lot of interaction and a lot of things going on in this game, so let's talk about them. Really quick, let's go over what the most valuable card for was this game, and it's gotta go to Oko Thief of Crowns. This card is banned in almost every format for a reason. This card is incredibly strong. Being able to play it for 3 mana, and it coming down with 4 loyalty, you plus 1 it to 5 to get rid of a problematic creature or artifact, and it kind of just protects itself being at such a high loyalty count. It really, on its own, kind of controlled the early game because everyone was scared that a, a an important permanent that they had could just instantly get elked, and it's relatively difficult to get rid of an elked commander or an elked Windsor orb. So playing around this card really shaped a lot of the early game, so I have to give it the most valuable, at least the most impactful card in this game. Now I don't want to talk about Ogo too much, but for this game specifically, Bill had Mirror Entity and Selvala very early on, and if it wasn't for Ogo, that combo would have been online much sooner or just at all in general. And the Elking of the Winter Orb caused Joseph to use a control piece that could have been used in a much better situation to his opponents. So Oko just being on the battlefield, for one thing, caused two pieces of removal or control to be used up, stopped Bill pretty much completely from comboing off, and took a lot of the attacks and the damage during that early game. So while it may not have seemed like it on the surface, Oko played a very large part in this game. In terms of just a general recap, I want to talk about how well Nate played around the different stacks pieces that were on the board. First off, when you play an artifact heavy deck and someone else is playing Lavinia, it's going to be a bad time. I think he discarded one or two zero cost artifacts that just ended up being useless throughout this game. So playing around that and also the fact that he's trying to ramp out quickly really did slow him down. On top of that, the very early turn one Hushbringer also did a lot of work in order to stop his win con, especially when he had Thassa's Oracle in his hand since the beginning. In addition to that, the Winter Orb just on top of this was just drastically slowing him down since he couldn't cast his cheap artifacts, and to cast his two mana cost artifacts, he kind of had to take a turn off since he'd only be untapping one of those lands on the next turn. So he did a good job of kind of flying under the radar, getting a lot of relevant value off of Necropotence, and knowing when was the right time to use Necropotence. He could have gone all in early at the start, but knowing it was better to hold off and go for the value Necropotence, all while waiting for some problematic pieces to get taken care of, 
really won him the game. Throughout this game, he was able to just lie low, wait for his time, get the passive life game from his commander, filtered that into some card draw without becoming too much of a threat, and then eventually was able to get the pieces he needed in order to assemble his win. So just overall, while you might see Demonic Consultation and think it's a rather boring win con, Demonic Consultation isn't about the destination, it's about the journey, and personally, I think Nate played this game very well, especially when so many people had a lot of problematic permanents that were trying to slow him down. That being said, that is all we have for Season 2, Episode 2. We here at Cash Competitive hope you enjoyed it. We have two more episodes coming for this season, and personally, I'm really excited for Episode 4 because I get to build and play a commander that I built almost a year ago and haven't touched too much since, so it's going to be a very fun time for me, and I think you'll enjoy what the next few episodes have in store. That being said, that is all we have for this video. Hope you guys did enjoy it. I am Joseph, this is Casually Competitive MTG, and we will see you next time.